So anyway, we're going to have some fun. And this is going to take just a couple hours, and it should go pretty fast. And we're going to talk a little bit about tourism, but I'm also going to vent about a couple of things about Issaquah. To give you some background, um, I travel 250 days a year. And John lives on Mercer Island. I live six miles from here. I'm in the corner of Issaquah, Renton Highlands, and Newcastle, just down SR 900. So for us, this is really kind of fun because even though I grew up in the San Juan Islands, we've lived in Bellevue for the last 30 years and in this area, and we've lived in your area for about seven years. And I'm going to tell you about my experiences in Issaquah, why we come here or why we don't come here, even though you're closer to us than most of the other shopping areas. So you ready for that? Okay. So we are going to talk about tourism for the 21st century and how this plays into Issaquah. And tourism is back and better than ever. And a couple of reasons why is, number one, it is the purest form of economic development. People come, spend money, and go home. And you know what? If they come here from North Bend, that's importing more cash into Issaquah. Or if they come here from Renton, or they come here from Bellevue, or they come here from Sammamish, they come here from anywhere else, if you can get them to spend more money and more time in Issaquah, we would consider that tourism. Technically, tourism is people that live 50 miles or more away coming here and spending the night, which is the ultimate goal because overnight visitors spend four times more than people that come here for the day. But you know what? If we can get them to stop on I-90, we'll take it, right? I mean, that's a good start. And by the way, in Washington State, tourism is a $17 billion industry. That's with a B. $17 billion. 50% of that takes place in Kings, Snohomish, and Pierce County. Are you getting your fair share? That is the question you need to ask. And that is balanced. To trade. You know, because, you know, the bottom line is, I'm going to show you how you can do it right now. There you go. And so here's the big deal. If you live in Issaquah and you spend money at Bellevue Square, you head downtown Seattle, you head over to Renton Landing, you head over to any of these places, you know what? That's leakage. And communities that leak out more than they import in die. There are more towns have gone bankrupt, have gone bankrupt in the last five years than in the previous 200 years plus of this country combined because towns need to act like businesses. So I'm going to show you that. Number two, travel spending is leading the economic recovery. I do sit on the board of the U.S. Travel Association based out of Washington, D.C., and we're doing everything we can to import more cash into the United States and then spread that money around. But the big deal, it is very, very important industry. And by the way, in 49 states, tourism is the first, second, or third largest industry. There's only one state where it ranks fourth, and that's Washington. And the only reason it ranks fourth is because we export more than most countries. If you think about Boeing and PACCAR and, and all of those things, that's why. So it's not a slam against Washington at all. It's a powerful industry. And so number three, tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. Anybody that's going to come here, I don't care whether they represent Swedish or Costco or anybody else that's here, Siemens, anybody. Site selectors, commercial real estate, they come here first as what? A visitor. Is this a place my employees would want to be? Is this a place I can make money? Is this a place that's good, good, got good quality of life? So they all come first as a visitor. And for the first time in U.S. history, quality of life is leading economic development, non-tourism. Before that, it was always about natural resources, transportation. And then finally, number four, it is the number one small business and fastest growing industry in America. And so remember that. And then finally, the last one, tourism is the largest engine in the, in the country for new business startups. That's how cool tourism is. And so finally, don't let anyone tell you that tourism is not economic development. I mean, I hear, well, it's a bunch of low-paying housekeeping jobs. It's a bunch of restaurant worker jobs. Well, you know what? It's still a small business family wage job industry as well. So I thought I'd do is tell you the seven ways that you can increase your visitor spending in Issaquah. 
And the first one is to promote and find your unique selling proposition. Here's the scoop. 90% of all Americans have immediate access to the internet. 90%. Whether it's on laptops, on our, on our smartphones, tablets, you name it, at home, at work, at school, 90%. And out of that group, 94% use the internet to decide where they're going to live, where they're going to go this weekend, what event they're going to attend, where they're going to buy a house. We all do, don't we? Don't you go to the internet? And so you know what's really interesting about this? We have every community in Washington at our fingertips in less than a third of a second. And by the way, we never type in Issaquah first. Have you ever typed in tent what's going on this weekend? See what I mean? What we do is we go to the internet, we type in activities. I'm looking for new home communities in the Issaquah area. I'm looking for the best Italian restaurant in Issaquah. I'm looking for job opportunities on the east side. I'm looking for a place to start a business in King County. But you notice when we use the internet, you notice the place was always at the end of the sentence, never at the beginning? So what do you stand for, Issaquah, besides Salmon Days? Which, by the way, is awesome. But what about the other 362 days of the year? See what I mean? So, 94%. Location is always going to be second to the primary draw, that one thing that puts you on the map. And even when you run ads, I want you to stop putting Issaquah at the top of your ads. In every ad you ever do, it should always be what the experience is. This happens to be in Devon, Alberta, which is a bedroom community next to, uh, to Edmonton. They're Bike Town, Alberta, grab life by the handlebars. Great tagline, huh? But you notice the city is down here. The city is always second to the experience what's going to pull us in Issaquah. We don't come to Issaquah because you're Issaquah. No offense. We come here because there's something that caters to us. You know, here's, you know, there you go. 70% of people, there you go, could that be you, are frustrated because you're busy promoting the city and we're looking for experiences. And that's what you have to understand. So, the next thing is, you cannot be all things to all people. Have you ever got, how many of you have ever gone anywhere because they had something for everyone? Yeah, no hands went up. What does that tell you? I mean, you can't be all things to all people and win anymore. And by the way, you can't be a gateway to the Cascade Mountains. A gateway is something you pass through to go somewhere else. See what I mean? And so those are things, you, and you can't be the center of it all. By the way, Port Angeles said they were the center of it all. Figure that one out. And so we are drowning in marketing in advertising and marketing overload. As a matter of fact, we're exposed to 5,000 marketing messages a day. Whether it's on license plate frames, whether it's on signs, billboards, radio, television, you name it, the internet, anywhere we go, 5,000 a day. Far more than the mind can absorb. So you know what we do? If it doesn't cater to us specifically, we just tune it out. There's my typical attendee. And so... You know, what you have to do is everything is at our fingertips in a fraction of a second. And look at this. There you go. That is, let me go back to that. I know it's there somewhere. Where is it? 97% of community-based marketing is ineffective. Because you're not seeing anything that separates you from North Bend, Renton, Bellevue, anywhere else. Muckle Teal, we could name down the list. And that's why. Everything has changed. So here's the question you have to ask. What do you have in Issaquah that the people you're hoping to attract can't get or do closer to home? Besides Salmon Days, you got that one. You own it, and it's great. What, what's that? We're going to talk about that. So, but that's the question you have to ask. Because if everything were just like home, there'd be no reason for leaving home. So you always have to answer that question, what do you have that they can't, the people you're trying to track can't get or do closer to home? Whatever it is that makes you totally different or clearly better, you need to hang your hat on that. And notice that better has an asterisk there because you know what? It has to be better by third-party endorsement. I started my career developing Whistler Resort. And when we were working up in Whistler, our whole goal was to be the number one rated ski resort destination in North America, which they have owned for more than 20 years. If it's better, we'll, we'll, go to, we'll drive three hours, three, four hours to Whistler over going to 
don't call me pass. See what I mean? If it's better. It's not necessarily different, but it is better. So you have to be one of those two things. And that is really critical. I call these the economic development dudes because competition has never been more fierce. There's not a city in the Washington State that would have liked to have had Swedish here like you have. See what I mean? And so you have all these people always gunning for you. Competition has never been more fierce. And there you go. And so what's interesting is, in this internet age, communities have been forced to specialize, just like businesses. I mean, dentists specialize, real estate agents specialize, lawyers specialize, everybody specializing, and now cities need to specialize to be known for that one thing that really sets themselves apart. And that is really important. But most just stand for nothing because we're trying to be all things to all people and politically correct. You know, as a consumer, if I like equestrian and an ad comes up that says we're having a really incredible horse show this weekend, and my eyes are going to perk up. My eyes and ears. But if I don't care about equestrian and I hear it, it just kind of, it just fades away. That's why you have to narrow your focus. What makes it really tough is the membership. By the way, the number one thing about killing this effort are memberships because you're trying to make everybody happy <coughs> and you can't these days. I'll give you a good example. We're working in a town called St. Albert. This is also a bedroom community in Edmonton. By the way, you can tell, you know, when, when we were in a big recession here, we ended up doing a lot of work in Canada. But St. Albert's there and they decided to be the Botanic art city. By the way, Gardening is the second fastest growing hobby in the United States. You know what number one is? Recreational bicycle. <laughs> number two in the United States. So they decided to be the Botanic Art City. As a matter of fact, they went out and designed all these kinds of posters like this, Cultivate Your Own Masterpiece. Or posters like this one that's going to come up eventually. There it is, Cultivate the Musician. So they took that whole Cultivate Life gardening brand and then they stretched it out a little bit. But what was really interesting is that they put all this stuff together, they put these together, and you can go into their library, you can go into their city hall, you can go anywhere, and you'll see these posters lined up on the walls. And you know what? It's so cool, because they had a garden center there that was about the size of Mulbacks. As a matter of fact, they're friends of Mulbacks in Woodinville. And they said, well, if we're gonna be the gardening capital of Canada, or this Cultivate Life, they spent $130 million creating a gardening and outdoor living center that is the best and biggest in North America, and they put it in St. Albert because they stood for something. That's how cool finding and narrowing your focus can be. This one is Alpena, Michigan. This is a little town of 10,000 in, in, the, in the eastern side of upstate Michigan. They are home of the National Marine Sanctuary there, which is Thunder Bay. There's more than 200 shipwrecks. And everything they do is revolves around the sanctuary brand. Because on the other side of the state is all Traverse City. It's a party town and everything. And they went for their whole branded sanctuary, and it's working. What is your focus, Issaquah? I mean, how many of you have been to Ashland, Oregon? Raise your hand. How many? Look, about half of you. You know, that's like a seven-hour drive from here. And for you that haven't been there, it is home to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And they're a Time Magazine rated one of the top ones. By the way, they do 11 productions a year. Only half of them are Shakespeare. And even those half, they've modernized. They have three theaters all in three acres. It's not much bigger than right here in this little complex. They have three theaters. They have about 2,000 seats. And guess what? Their Shakespeare Festival runs six days a week, nine months of the year. And you know what the Shakespeare budget is? Shakespeare Festival budget is? $75 million a year. It employs 350 full-time employees year-round. And guess what? They only host 125,000 visitors. So the idea, you don't have to say, the last thing we need is a whole bunch of tourism in Issaquah. We're a residential community. There's probably, probably nobody would think that though, right? Didn't think so. But they only get 125,000 people a year. But you know what? The average day is four nights and 92% come back every year, every other year. That is powerful tourism. So the other thing you need to do is get people's attention with all your marketing. 
And so we, I was working in Wisconsin, and, and I said, okay, I'm going to design an ad. I had 20 minutes to design an ad. So I asked the audience, just give me a saying. I didn't even tell them what I was going to promote. I said, just give me a funny quote, something. So somebody in the audience said, okay, if one out of four people in this country are mentally imbalanced. That's what I was given. And there's more to it, I'll tell you in a minute. And then I said, well, you know what? I'm marketing a spa. So now I got to market a spa using those words, right? So I went in, so I wrote that down like it was the top of an ad. Then I went and grabbed an ice stock photo of a gal who looks like she's slightly mentally imbalanced. And then I knew it was marketing spa, so I grabbed another photograph. And then I wrote the body text. So the whole idea is to get our attention. You saw this on half a page in a magazine. One out of four people in this country are mentally imbalanced. Think of your three best friends. If they seem okay, then you're the one. That was the quote I was given. Perhaps it's time you found your balance. Book a spa stay at the incredible Kalahari Spa Sanity Retreat this May. We did this for Mother's Day. Bring your three best friends and save 30%. Book it right now while you're thinking clearly at www.sanitreat.com and then only in Wisconsin Dells. See what I mean? It's not about the place, it's about the experience. So with your marketing, are you getting people's attention? But the bottom line is you cannot be all things to all people. You have to promote your truly unique selling products. You know, it's been around for decades, but it's more important than it's ever been before. And by the way, for you in business, this stands for you too. I don't care whether you're insurance or whether you have medical or whether you're in marketing industry, all of this stuff applies to you too. And you know, you're saying, but we have so much more than that. If we focused Issaquah on... Gilman Village, or we focus this or qua on uh, hang gliding. Somebody's going to say, we have so much more than that. See what I mean? But you cannot be, you know, this is what I hear everywhere I go. Everywhere. And there's no excuses if you want to succeed. The narrower your focus, the stronger your success will be as a business and as a community. So I got a question for you. Okay, I need your help. I'm going to tell you what the brand is, what they're known for. You tell me where it is, okay? You ready? The country music capital, who owns it? Nashville. Did I hear somebody say something other than Nashville? Okay, Nashville. There you go. You got it. Okay, the gamble you don't find, who owns that? They own it. Okay, how about this one? Kids and family, who owns it? You just did perfect what I thought you were going to do. You did not say Orlando or Anaheim. You said Disney. It just shows the experience trumps the place. Okay? You're right. Music theater capital, and it's not New York City. Anybody know? Who said Branson? Way to go! A little town, Branson, Missouri. It's a town of 6,500 people that has 49 music theaters, all of them privately developed, and they host 7.5 million visitors a year. Graceland Elvis is where? Memphis. How come only three people knew that? And do you think there's more to do in Memphis than just Graceland? Yeah, I've had people say no. But they do. Blues, you know, lots of, uh, they're famous for barbecue. Why in your capital of the United States is where? Napa Valley owns it. So, you know, Frozen Tundra. Okay, football fans, where is that? Green Bay. Yeah, Green Bay. <laughs> Green Bay. You know, they said, well, Roger, what are we going to do in Green Bay? We've done a lot of work there. And they go, what are we going to do in Green Bay? We're known for the frozen tundra in the winter for a football game played in 1967. Okay, so here you go. Here's another one. Deep sea fishing. Who owns that in Washington State? You got it. See what I mean? So Washington's beaches, name, name a couple places. Who would own the beaches? Long Beach, and, and I heard Ocean Shores. You got it. Okay, Bavarian? There you go. Easy. Victorian Seaport Village. There you go, Port Townsend. Good, you guys are good. How about, who's the state, who owns that one? Olympia. And... Uh, see, I heard both. 
And so that's what you need to know. And Issaquah, what do you stand for? Besides Salmon Days. You know what? I got to tell you something. I was speaking in Gilroy, California. What do you know him for? Garlic. 150,000 people over three days. It's one of the biggest festivals in the United States, the Garlic Festival. So I went down there, and I was speaking to them, and I said, so what's your brand the other 362 days of the year? And they said, that's why you're here. See what I mean? But I'm glad, because Salmon Days does put you on the map, but how are you going to get us here the rest of the year? And how is that sustainable for all your businesses? That's the question you have to answer. So you need your key players on the same page pulling in the same direction. You know, when you find your focus in Issaquah, you're going to go from this. Here's the typical economic development express. Look familiar? Could that be Issaquah? Could that be pretty much any community? There's our chamber, the economic development, community development, tourism, marketing. I mean, that's typical. When you have a focus, all of a sudden you get everybody on the same page pulling in the same direction, you go from that to that. And that's why you need to know this thing. So that was number one, narrow your focus. Find your unique selling proposition. Number two, you need to jettison the mar your, your marketing, jettison the generic. If you Google jettison the generic, you're gonna see my name over a whole bunch of pages. And that's what you're gonna see. You know, and I do this, words and phrases to avoid. Look familiar? Could that be any town anywhere in Washington State? You know, I was speaking in Wisconsin at the Governor's Conference about a month ago, and this, this list was coming up, and a lady jumped up and went like this, and I stopped everything, and I said, yes, ma'am, and she goes, I think we're using all of those. She goes, explore, discover our outdoor recreation, which is unlike anywhere, so so much see and do in our four season destinations, she started going right down the list. But those words and phrases could fit any town anywhere in Washington State. That's the problem. Now you know why 97% of our marketing doesn't work. By the way, I have some of these in posters. I'll get some to, uh, to Matt at the chamber, and, and you guys can have these. But you know what? I could do another poster for businesses, what they do that's so generic. But to win, you must do that. You know, I got a question. I want to know if you'd go over there because this. So I'm going to read this to you. Discover the wide open spaces, gracious people, and picturesque landscapes that characterize this Tenasket, Washington. Anybody here ever been to Tenasket? It's over by OMAC, a few of you. Each season holds a promise of a new adventure and an incredible memory. Come join us in Tenasket and discover the scenic and recreational opportunities that, the opportunities that await you. So having read that, how many of you are going to make a special trip over to the OMAC area in Okanagan County to visit Tenasket? Go ahead, raise your hand. You're a mean bunch here in Issaquah. Nobody raised their hand. But you know what? That even wasn't even written for Tenasket. It was written for Nelson, British Columbia. Here's the point. If I go on your website, any of your websites, and I can take out the name of your business or the word Issaquah and plug in another town, and it still rings true, you just lost a sale. It's that simple. So, and by the way, I say you're not doing anything wrong, you're just doing what everybody else is doing. And that is the problem. As a matter of fact, look at this. Look at your taglines. Look at your key marketing messages. Look at your introductory text, and if it can fit anybody, start over. This is why 97% of our marketing is ineffective. You cannot be all things to all people these days and win. You must promote your primary lure, that one thing that really puts you on the map, sustainable, year-round, and then say, while you're here, you also need to do this and this and this and this and this. Does that make sense? That's what you have to do. The narrower your focus is a city, the stronger your success will be. Same with businesses. People come to us and say, well, Roger, you'd work all over. We, by the way, we've worked in 45 states all across Canada and all over Western Europe. And people say, well, you do all this branding and marketing and tourism. Can you help me in a business? I said, that's not our niche. Our niche is working with cities and towns. Everybody, you have to have a niche these days. I'll give you a business example. This is Stu Leonard's grocery store in Connecticut. It was a mom pas store. It was founded in 1969. They handed it over to the kids in 1989. Guess what happened? The very next year, Walmart came to town. Two years later, Costco came to town. If you're a mom pas grocery store, how do you compete with that? 
So they knew that if they were going to survive as a mom pog or store, they had to narrow their focus, and that's exactly what they did. You know what they did? They gutted their stores so it looks like this building. And they concentrated their entire effort on farm fresh produce and dairy. Notice how their, notice how their displays look? They look like a farmer's market. So their entire focus was farm fresh. Now, could you buy laundry detergent there? Absolutely. But they had a focus that Walmart and Costco couldn't compete with, or even Safeway and other stores. And to illustrate that they're about farm fresh, they have staff dressed as cows and chickens. How would you like a job there? And they put in a world-class bakery inside the store. They put a farmyard zoo outside the store. They have displays that go moo and cluck when you push the buttons. They give you free ice cream if you spend $100 or more, and this is their slogan, profit is the applause of happy customers. Well, that's what they're known for, farm fresh produce and dairy, fresh baked goods. You want to know the result of narrowing their focus? They have the highest per square foot retail sales of any grocery store on the planet. That is the power of narrowing your focus. And by the way, you could bring it on Costco, bring it on Walmart, bring it on Safeway, QFC, everybody else, because they just opened their fifth store. See what I mean? You must narrow their, your focus. And they've won every award. They're in the Guinness Book of World Records. You name it. It's awesome. So, at the end of the day, you must jettison the generic. And I love this quote. Something forever result in mediocrity and ultimate failure. Well, there you go. I'm just going to keep saying this till you re memorize those three words, jettison the generic. So you have to find out what sets you apart as a business and as a community. And then while we're here, we'll do other things. Shopping in, for visitors, if we come out from Bellevue, I'll give you a good example. I belong to a car club. And at least once a year, we head right out to Triple X Root Beer, right here in Issaquah. And while we're here, we will go downtown, we'll go to Bohm's, we'll go to all these other places. See what I mean? But what is that one thing that sets you apart that you can really hang your hat on? And then while we're here, we'll do this. And then, these are all amenities. And that, by the way, that's the most important amenity a community can have right there. Because relieved visitors spend more. True. True. And then ambience. Historic downtowns are not a draw, by the way. It's all part of the ambience. Very important, but not the primary draw. And then there's that icon, that's a photo opportunity that says, I was really there for you. That might be the triple X sign, you know, over at the Ruby. I don't know what it is. But that's that photo opportunity that says, oh, I was just there, and we pin it. It's on Instagram. It's wherever. And you always promote your primary lure, your anchor tenant. I'll give you a good example of that. How many of you would go to Orlando if Disney World was not there? Raise your hand. You're not raising your hands at anything, are you? But you know what? You just insulted 171 other attractions. But we all know that Disney is the anchor tenant. While we're there, we'll go to Universal Studios, we'll go to Wild Kingdom, we'll go to all those Epcot centers, we'll do all that, right? That's what we do. So you need to have that one thing that brings people into Issaquah and then say, while you're here, you can do all of this stuff. Let me show you the case history. And by the way, those anchor tenants can't survive without the complementary activities, which means those other things we can do while we're here. I'll tell you, my car, our car club that I belong to would not go to XXX if, there wasn't, if that was the only thing in Issaquah. And so that's what you have to understand. There you go. Don't just market what you have. Market what differentiates you, what will close the, so, close the sale. Find your niche and promote it like crazy. So one last time, there you go. Here's another one. Salem, Massachusetts. Probably it's about 40,000. What are you known for? If it wasn't for the witches, would you have ever heard of Salem, Massachusetts? It's for the 1692 witch trials. You know, the challenge is they're tired of the brand. They want to move on. It's been their brand for almost 325 years. And now they want to move on? So they went out and spent $200,000. Are you ready for this? And this is what they came up with. Visit Salem. We have something for everyone. Isn't that special? 
See what I mean? And if you go there, and yes, they do have the Salem Witch Museum right there, and it is world class. And if you buy ice cream, it's probably going to be at the Dairy Witch. And you might go over to the Witch House or the Spellbound Museum, and every night they go do uh, ghost walking tours. And they have the Witch History Museum there, and the Witch Salem Village, or Salem Witch Village. And where else would you go anywhere in the world and get your picture taken with Samantha from the 1960s sitcom Bewitched? And four million visitors go out of their way to visit Salem. So you know what they did? They threw away all that money, and then they decided to come in with a compromise. And uh, so they spent a whole bunch more money. You ready? Here it is. See if this is going to make you want to fly across the country and go there. Here it is. Still making history. Does it make you want to go there? Does it tell you anything about them? Is your first response is, are they still hanging people? You know, so they're known for the witch trials. The lore is the witch trial museum and the grave site where 22 people were buried that lived there over eight months. This, I mean, lived there over, where they, this whole thing took place in eight months. And they killed those 22 people during that time. But while you're there, you have great dining, unique shops, historical walking tours, recreational activities, on and on and on. If this was easy, everyone would be doing it. You need to narrow your focus as a business and as a community. What do you want to be known for? And number three, you need to create marketing partnerships. Here's a couple of things. The more you have to offer collectively, the further people come and the longer they will stay. Whether it's businesses, that's the power of Gilman Village, is by collective marketing. So what about Issaquah? You know, there you go. Marketing dozens of attractions and activities like you have is like herding cats. And so, how do you wrap them up as a uni unified single voice? I want to show you some th ideas. And this is Tacoma, where they had a challenge is they had the Museum of Glass, the Washington State History Museum, and the Tacoma Art Museum, and they're all running their own ads. They're all separately. And so they finally got together and ran them all together. And you know what? Their visitation almost doubled while they cut their marketing dollars because they work together. And so this is the power of partnerships because together all three of these are worth the drive from Issaquah. But independently, you may go, well, that's a long, you know, that's another, it's an hour away, if we're lucky, just to go see one museum. But together it works. So there you go. You're far more effective as one loud voice. That is why tourism is important and why it's good to get everybody on the same page pulling in the same direction. I'll give you another one. This is down in Thurston County, and I think I actually have this one. They actually have a whole bunch of museums down there. And what you're seeing is this very brochure that I'm holding in my hands. They had all these little museums. Like, did you know Bing Crosby was born in Olympia area, and that's where his home is, actually in Tumwater? And so they had all these museums, and all these museums could not afford... They were of their own brochures, so they had little like photocopied brochures. They had no way to distribute them. They had all these little museums. So one gal down there in the city of Tumwater named Carla Wolfsburg got them all together, and they each paid for just one panel. So they had 11 museums down there, and each one of them paid for this. That they could afford to do. And then together, they could afford to send this out. And then by working together, they were worth, Olympia was worth a drive. I mean, how far would you drive to go see a 20-minute museum experience? But when you band them all together into one little brochure, look at the outcome. Their attendance tripled while cutting the collective marketing budgets by two-thirds. That's the power of partnerships. That's why you have a tourism organization or economic development that works with the whole community. And number four, you need to promote your anchor tenants. And act anchor tenants are activity generators. They are things we would go an hour out of our way specifically for, and you need to promote those. And so one of the, one of, you know what? You want to do something good, Issaquah? You need to create the very best of Issaquah and promote your anchor tenants. And that can be a brochure that's just, that we would go out of our way for. You know, there you go. You need to have one or two of those, and I'm going to, I keep going over to this side. And so I want to show you one. You know what? It's just like Walt Disney. Like you didn't raise your hand when I said how many would go to Walt Disney or how many would go to Orlando if Disney World wasn't there. And yet while we're there, we'll do all these other things. 
you know, SeaWorld, on and on and on. But the bottom line is, what do you have that's worth a 45-minute drive to Issaquah? And you do have some. You need to promote them specifically. So, you know, what makes you worth a special trip? You know, I've got a question for you. How many of you would eat at this fine restaurant? Go ahead, raise your hand. Oh, come on. Oh, we got one, two, three, four. Now we got about five. It is dinner time, you know. And so there it is. By the way, it's not on fire. It's a barbecue place. What's that? They're serving barbecue. Would you go in there? Yeah, see, there you go. It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Here it is from the outside. There you go. There it is right there. And to try to ignore the folded chairs and the garbage cans and, you know, all that kind of stuff. There it is there. It was actually a fundraiser for this church. And there it is. Try to ignore the cardboard boxes and stuff, you know. And there there's our host. He's, he's out man in the barbecue. And the door handle gets a little bit greasy, but don't worry. It's not that bad. They give you a little towel that's inside. And when you walk in that place, there it is from the inside. So how many of you, you still shouldn't go in there? Okay, and by the way, they have these folding chairs there, and don't worry, they're not that rusted. And so you could go in there, and they've got the baggies there, and they have some art on the wall. They ran out of duct tape, so they use strapping tape to hold it up. And they get some articles. Notice that, how it's framed on the wall there. Yeah, there it is. Well, guess what? Gentlemen's Quarterly Magazine. I almost feel bad showing this cover now that we've lost Philip Seymour Hoffman. But a couple years ago, GQ magazine rated the 10 meals to fly for in the world. You know where I'm headed. And they named the New Zion Missionary Baptist Church Barbecue in Huntsville, Texas as number three. That place you just saw. So how many of you are going to cancel your subscription to GQ now that you know what it looks like? See what I mean? And by the way, when you go in there, I mean, it's, I, I don't know you know how to get a health permit. They're in a residential zone, but they become such a landmark, the city can't shut them down. And you walk in there, and, the, and by the way, it's an African-American church choir that ran this. And they'll start humming gospel songs, and pretty soon the patrons will start clapping to the music. And they'll say, sir, you can sit down right there. If I sit down over there, I said, sir, we said there, move. You go, yes, ma'am. And you move. They are such characters. You can pay first, pay later. They bring out big plates of barbecue. You smell like barbecue for three days afterwards. And busloads of people come 150 miles just to have lunch there. You know, and so it's, it's incredible. They called me up and said, thanks for promoting us so much, Roger. You know, we're thinking about opening up a regular big barbecue place in Huntsville, Texas. If you're in Texas, you'd be like one of, a, you'd be one of, you know, you'd be like every other barbecue. City didn't like it when I told him that. But, you know, that's part of what made them different. We worked in one other town called Alpena. Yeah, I told you about Alpena, Michigan. That's that sanctuary place. And Issaquah should do this. What they did is they found their anchor tenants, the very best businesses. By the way, there's no lodging in here. It's businesses, rest, it's restaurants, retail shops, and activities. Restaurants, retail shops. There's no hotels because we want the Holiday Inn to hand this brochure out. You know what the number one asked question is of visitors in the world? Where's a good place to eat and don't hand me a list? I don't want a directory. I don't want a list. If you won't tell me, I'll just go to TripAdvisor or Yelp and I'll just do it on my own. Wouldn't it be cool if you say, well, here's the very best to Issaquah. And you hand them one of these brochures. And so, they, of course, they have the Maritime Heritage Center. They've got the 2,000 shipwrecks or 200 shipwrecks there. How cute is that? And by the way, there's no franchises in here. They've got an incredible trail system they promote. They've got the marketplace. These are all a mix of retail shops. There's a winery right there. I mean, and, th and this is it right here. This is the brochure that I'm showing you. And so you might have six, you might have 10. You need to promote your anchor tenants. And you know what? If you promote your anchor tenants, wouldn't it be cool instead of you going to Seattle and Bellevue if they came here? Wouldn't that be cool? And that's why you need to do this. So by the way, each one of these was invited. I'm going to tell you the criteria in a second. They were all invited to take part in this. And they each paid $400 per panel. 
It's a public-private partnership. By the way, I don't ever want to hear this. Well, tourism is lodging taxes. We can't use tax dollars to promote private business. That's baloney. Because you know what? Private business is what tourism and economic development are all about. Can you imagine? Come to Orlando. We can't mention any of our attractions because they're all privately owned, but you should come anyway. Come to Napa Valley. We have 240 wineries. We can't mention my name because they're all privately owned. This is a public-private partnership. Here's the criteria they use. They had to be highly regarded by somebody other than themselves. For instance, 80% plus positive reviews on TripAdvisor, Yelp, written up in Sunset Magazine. See what I mean? Highly regarded. And then they had to have good curb appeal. Then they had to be open at least June through October in their case. In your case, they have to be open year-round, and they should be open at least six days a week. And they should be open until at least, in your case, at least 7 o'clock p.m., and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. And they had to be open at least six days a week. That was their criteria. You could have your own Issaquah criteria. Because if you want me to come from Olympia, Seattle, Bellevue to Issaquah, what do you have that I can get closer to home? And you do have a few. And I'm just going to give you Gilman Village to g collectively. I wouldn't say, but you know what? I easily drive the six miles from my favorite place in Gilman Village. It's the clock shop. We could have all our batteries replaced and watches and stuff, but my wife loved that little clock shop. But you can promote Gilman Village collectively as one of your anchors. I think it's really cool. It's been kind of sad to see it kind of dissipate from where it was 20 years ago, but I'm going to help. I'm going to give you an idea how you could help that. I mean, Village Theater and the other partnering theater obviously would be great. They are worth a special trip. You know, maybe the parents, you know, I don't know, maybe you don't promote this because you know what, there's everybody's park, you know what I'm talking about. It's no parking along the street, yet it's full of cars every weekend and everything, but you know what, it's pretty cool to watch all that happening. Um, I mean, you know, the Montalcino Restaurante, you know, I mean, and you got a couple other ones. I mean, John, John, you come out here all the time, and you do a couple of big boxes, but what's the restaurant that you go to? 12th Street Cafe, Cafe right? 12th Street Cafe? He'll come out here for the 12th Street Cafe for breakfast, right? And so, from Mercer Island. And of course, Salmon Days, you may say, well, how's that a business or whatever? But it is such an anchor for you, it's got to be one of those best of Issaquahs. Absolutely. And that's why I say market is an anchor tenant, but you might even take some of the businesses in Gilman. What I'm saying is do this. And you might have, you might have in your guide, you might have 20 different businesses, but each one of them is worth a drive all by themselves. And so what I might, and by the way, in Alp, and oh, you know, I would even put that there. You may say, because there's nothing like it. And I'm probably missing some. I just did it just off the top of my head today. Tried to grab a few that are all of these individually I would drive 45 minutes for. And you know what? Talk about importing a lot of cash. You do have three and a half million people live within an hour of you, or an hour and a half. Wouldn't it be great if they spent a little more time in Issaquah? That's what this is about, importing cash. So, yeah, absolutely promote those, whatever they are. And um, what cool thing is, you know what happened when they did this in Alpena? Some people complain, well, you picked them and you didn't pick me, and I think I'm just as good as they are. You know what they're saying afterwards? By the way, they each paid $400. Those people are now saying that was the best $400 I never spent because I didn't realize that when they came down there to my neighbor's business, they all came into my business. Think about this. If you go to Bellevue Square, you're going to go there for the anchor tenants, whether it's Nordstrom's, whether it's Benny's, whether it's the Apple Store. And while you're there, you might buy cell phones, you might go to GNC Nutrition Center, you might go into the Origin Store, all those little shops, right? Everybody benefits from the anchor tenants. You need to promote them. If you just did this one brochure, you'd see your retail sales in this go up dramatically. Always promote your anchor tenants and everybody else will benefit. By the way, you know what they did with this? 10,000 people live there. They mailed one of these to every residence. Like, it was like 3,500, 4,000 homes. They mailed one of these to them with a little card, and here's what the card said, I'm paraphrasing. The number one reason people travel is to visit friends and family. 
We hope you'll hang on to this brochure so that when friends and family visit you, you will share with them the best of what Issaquah, in your case, has to offer. Because we believe that every dining room table should be a concierge desk. Within days, people would come down to downtown Alpena and go, I, I got this in the mail. How long have you been here? The merchant would go, 10 years? Within 90 days, the hotel stays in Alpena, Michigan tripled. Now, they only had nine hotel rooms. No, I'm kidding. They actually have about 400 hotel rooms. They tripled because people said, you know what, I wonder how many people are coming here for Costco Swedish or Siemens or any other big area. I wonder how many of people are coming here because of their corporate headquarters are here, but they're staying in Bellevue or Seattle or near SeaTac because they don't know what you have here and you have a lot. I hope that makes sense. Number five, this is for all of you in business and for the city, digital marketing should be priority number one. And so I want you to spend your marketing dollars the right way. And I'm going to tell you as a community, but this also applies to businesses, that digital should be about 45% of your ad budget. That is website, uh, e-newsletter, uh, pay-per-click if you have to, you know, search engine optimization, all of those things, all the digital marketing and advertising. 45% of your total marketing budget should be placed there. And then 20% on advertising, and that's to drive people to your website. And then public relations, which is articles written about you. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And then printed materials, about 10%. And then trade shows and signs and billboards and all that other stuff, about 5%. So if you want to spend your money the right way, and that's pretty rough, but uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, how does that make you different? How is that special? Absolutely right. Right. And the, by the way, the days of sending out press releases and public service announcements are over. Did you know that 99.5 out of 100 get thrown away? Because they're not different. You're right. They don't, there's no story there. And we could spend all day on this, but I wanted to touch on that because I thought it was really important that you spend your dollars the right way. And remember, this is not about you. When it comes to social media, you know what? You cannot judge your success by how many likes, followers, and uh, what's the other thing I wanted to say? Likes, followers, and uh, you, tweets, yeah. Friends, there you go. Likes, followers, and friends. You know what the deal is with this? It's about them. So I have a daughter. She's 36. She has three little kids. We have three little grandkids. They moved to Edmond. Her husband works there. They went out on the ferry over to uh, Kingston. So they took the Washington State Ferry there. She has 320 friends on Facebook. She was telling her 320 friends about their experience on the Washington State Ferry, the largest public ferry fleet in, the, in North America, um, and how they went over there and what they did in Kingston. And all of a sudden, I started watching her, her followers, her friends, were saying, boy, I want to take my kids over there. See what I mean? It's not about what you post on Facebook. It's about what they post on Facebook. That is the power of social media. And that's what you need to know. So you ought to have a place. You've got to get a picture of the Triple X or Bohms or wherever it is. Get those pictures here. Say, here's a great picture. And by the way, we have Wi-Fi. Post it to Instagram or Pinterest, or Flickr, or whatever, your Facebook page. That, and then they'll tell their tribe, look, I'm here at the Triple X Root Beer, it's got this really cool 1950s or 60s sign here, and then they post that, and then other people learn about it. That is the power of social media and digital. And so those kinds of things. I was working in, we do a lot of work in Nova Scotia, and they have the world-famous Cabot Trail, one of the 10 great drives in the United States. They were fighting over what signs they should put up. We should put Welcome to the Cabot Trail in Gaelic and French and in English. I said, no, don't do any of that. I want you to put World Famous Cabot Trail. And they did, and it's the most photographed thing in the Atlantic provinces of, Ca of, of Canada. And so this is just a Facebook post. Here's another guy at another sign wearing his motorcycle gear. You can't, they said, Roger, we have people taking pictures in front of that sign 365 days a year. Even in the middle of the winter in Nova Scotia, they're out there taking pictures of the famous sign. So 
So if you put the world famous Bones chocolates, I mean, you can't believe how many people will take their picture there. Or whatever it is that you're promoting. And then people want details. Here's the big deal. If you're selling fishing, which I don't think you are in this squad, but if you were, you know what happens is 60% of people that are planning a weekend getaway or what are we going to do this weekend, 60% are doing it when they shouldn't be. They're at work. They're at school. They're sitting there in church. And you know what? They're not going to be calling a visitor information line or a chamber of commerce. They're going to be on the net. And so you need to tell them, what will I catch? Where do I get a fishing license? How much is that fishing license? What are the catch limits? When are the fishing season? What time of day is best? What kind of bait should I use? Is there a bait and tackle shop in town? I could go right down this whole list here of all of these things. And those are the kinds of details you don't have on your websites. When you open, how many days a week you open? What are your hours? All those kinds of things. We want details, not generalities. If your website doesn't offer anything more than what you have in a brochure, then your website's not going to work. Okay? And avoid less. Oh, you know the most overused words in the world are? Outdoor recreation and the word unique. Come to Issaquah. We have all kinds of unique shops and restaurants. Well, who doesn't? I mean, see what I mean? And the word unique is so overused, it's come to mean just like everyone else. And that's a problem. So, create sample itineraries. I mean, you can't believe how powerful that is. And promote them. You know, millions of people subscribe to travel publications because they, they have travel writers give you specifics and you don't. You give them generalities. Because you're so afraid to promote one person over another one. All those politics. Yeah, you know Rick Steves? Our famous Edmund native. He's so far because of Terry State. This being me, go to this restaurant, do this, that's what people want. So, you cannot let local politics kill your marketing efforts. You know, I hear like this are all the time. This is happens to be in Cleveland. At 9 o'clock, no bread, breakfast, or espresso, Preston's Bakery. 10 o'clock, take in the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Botanical Garden. At 12 And you can do this. You need to do this. This is the kind of thing we want. Spend a day in this walk and give me samples. If it's a girls' weekend out, create a girls' weekend out itinerary. It's families with kids. It might be a different itinerary. You know, I would give you a good example. If you own a BMW, you might get BMW magazine, and they have driving tours all over the world in it. But if you belong to the BMW Car Club of America, it has driving tours in the United States, but if you belong to the Puget Sound BMW Club, you're going to get Zunfold magazine. And you know what? Every month they go somewhere. So here it is, reasons to visit your Canadian club neighbors in August. It was a sample itinerary that they sent to, BM to Zunfold. Here's another one, Cannon Beach. Notice this is Seattle chapter. You notice we're sending them to Oregon and British Columbia. And there's the Mountain Twisties Drive Recap, which is Highway 20, you know, up near Concrete and all those areas. But they're looking for places. And when they put together itineraries, they'll tell you, we're going to stop here for this breakfast. We're going to stop here and spend the night. They want sample itineraries. And by the way, on everything you do, you should have video content. And by the way, it only needs to be 20 seconds. I mean, look at this. This looks like a lot of fun, and it's 20 seconds long. That's all you have to do. And then finally get noticed. This is one for you and the businesses. You know, these days people are using Living Social, Groupon, those kinds of things. If you are striking, by the way, with these sites, you give them half. You cut your price down and they get 50%. But you know what? If you have a new business or a business that's not being recognized, Jordan in our office is 27 years old. And then we have Becky in our office who, and they always are looking at Living Social, at Groupon, Amazon Local. They're looking for special things to do this weekend. So if you're struggling to get people in your door, you know what? They do all the marketing and everything for you. And so, yes, you got to give them a lot of your money, but you know what? Once they come to you, if you're good enough, they'll come back again and again. And next time, it's not discounted. 
But sometimes that's the way you do. That's Groupon, there's Living Social, and it's hotels, it's restaurants, it's car washes. Matter of fact, there was, I think it was called Butler's. I think it's Butler's, and it's a car detail place in Issaquah. It used to be right on Gilman Village across the street from the village, or on Gilman Boulevard. And I remember seeing him in, living, in, in a Living Social, and so I had my car detailed there, and, uh, and I don't think that they're still there. But, you know, for two years, we had all our cars detailed there. And we only got the first one for half price. And so all of these are great places to do, and there they all are. You know, if you're struggling being notif- or being recognized, start there. It's a powerful way to get found if you're a business. So there you go. There's Amazon Local right there. Look, it's right down to hamburgers and stuff. People look at these, and they get email alerts for things that cater to them. And then watch your peer reviews, businesses, because you know what? 98% of people say that reviews are important, whether it's restaurants, it doesn't matter what it is. We look at reviews. Have you ever traveled anywhere and used, you know what? The, the most visited travel website now is, is uh, TripAdvisor, number one. So that's really important. I won't go through all of these. These have to do with lodging and everything, but it's just the importance of peer reviews. And so watch what people say about you. And this is for you and retailers and restaurants. Nothing is more important than that. And here's my biggest pet peeve with Issaquah. You can't find a damn thing in this town. We... So I got to tell you this, I grew up in the San Juans, then I lived in Bellevue for 20 years, and then we moved down to Olympia, and we lived here, we have lived in your neighborhood for seven years, and we avoid Issaquah, because we can't find anything, because you do not believe in wayfinding. Now, I understand that the city of Issaquah doesn't want a bunch of signs there, I'm not talking about retail signs, I'm talking about directional signs, signs like this are not very helpful, by the way. But you know, having some decorative signs that are along Gilman Boulevard, and you don't have to say, well, in here is Target and REI and Alicia. You don't have to, all you have to say is Target is this way, or the post office is this way. You only put five items. That, then a retailer in there could say, follow the signs to Target, and you'll find us off to the left or to the right. See what I mean? So it's not like you have to list every business out there. They don't have to be really high signs. But in Issaquah, because you're a beautiful community, because you're very tree-lined, you know what? I know that millions and millions of dollars are not being spent in Issaquah because people can't find anything. Try to find Pier 1 imports in this town. I mean, I went there once, and they had to give me detailed directions, and then I saw a movie theater back there, and then my wife once said, we should go movie theater and try the one out in Issaquah. I said, I don't think I could ever find that again. Even finding this. You know, I'm going, which side of the freeway is Costco on? And by the way, you know what? I got to tell you something. I think, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'll bet you the average person in Puget Sound, Sound thinks that Issaquah is in the south side of the freeway and Sammamish is on the north side. We just don't know what you have because you don't believe in wayfinding signage. And it should be decorative. This is in Appleton, Wisconsin, And uh, this is the sign. It costs $600. It's on an existing power pole. They put up 18 of those, and their retail sales went up by almost 20%. You're losing tens of millions of dollars because people don't want to fight the traffic. Fight, not the traffic. They don't want to fight the nightmare trying to find stuff in Issaquah. And so, you know, this is Oak Harbor. They have one set of signs for visitors, set of signs for a separate set of signs for that. You know, even when I came in and I met Matt and Andrea and some people over at City Hall, you know what? I had to use my navigation system. I live six miles away. You know, and so this, if there was ever one thing you wanted to do, there's the call. it looks at the question, that's what they do. It should always fit your brand. This is York, England. It's a, like a 16th, 17th century town, so they made sure their signs look like it. Covington, Kentucky, it's an entertainment district, so all the signs look like it. So this should be a priority for you. And every city that has done a wayfinding system, it's an investment. It's never been expense. Just so you know, wayfinding systems increase retail sales services by an average of 18%. 
That's a lot of money. But you know, for us, we go to Bellevue, we go to Renton Landing, even though we're just close to you. And the reason is we just don't know where everything's located. And we can't find it. This one here is about $1,500. This is in a little town of 5,000 people in Massachusetts, but it's a freestanding sign. And by the way, you never do more than five items on a sign. Here's one. I saw this in Woodlands, Texas, and I instantly thought, this is the kind of signs you should have in Issaquah. Fits totally in. It's Woodlands, Texas. It totally fits in. So can you imagine having some signs like this every once in a while down Gilman Boulevard or on front, or even off of Front Street if you're going down, what is it, May Valley, some of these other roads and stuff you have on, the, on this side of the freeway even. If you had a few signs like that, we'd be able to find stuff that you have. We've seen you promote your farmer's market. We've never come to it because we didn't know where, we didn't know how to find this place. No signs. There's my scolding for the day. Going, man, we can't wait for that guy to leave. And so, and by the way, it needs to be contrasting colors. Can you read that? That was in Long Beach, California. He said, that's not very good. White on yellow, are you kidding? So they had to redo them all. By the way, navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. In wayfinding, we've, in navigation systems, we punch things in that we already know about, right? Oh, I heard there's a chocolate place here, but I don't know how you spell bones. See what I mean? So what would they type in? And by the way, 40% of things on wayfinding, on navigation systems are in the incorrect location or are gone. And so that's the challenge you have. And by the way, you could even do pedestrian wayfinding to get us off of Front Street and down some of these places. And that would be great. That's in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I mean, that's what Disney does. And if you ever do an ex want a good example, follow their lead. You know, you can also do pedestrian wayfinding. This is French Lick, Indiana. Really great wayfinding, pedestrian wayfinding, how to find things. And it should start right where there's public parking. This is Lewiston, Idaho. When you get out of your car, they instantly tell you what there is to do right in their downtown. And so there you go. Includes your gateways, your entryways, attractions, amenities, billboards, marketing displays, retail, mall areas. And remember, you don't have to list every business. It would be a free-for-all. I'm all for you not listing every business out there on Gilman or anywhere else. But if you just put the anchor tenants like Costco or a few of those, and then a business can say, well, you know, I'm right next to Costco over here. And that way, they'll just follow that. Right, and he, he just, if you didn't hear him, he talked about that also includes a freeway signage. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I don't think so. You know, and I think you have 20 million vehicles or 20 million people a year drive right through you on Interstate, Light, on Interstate 90, and whether they're coming this way, you're the gateway to Seattle if they're coming from the east, and I don't want you to use those words. But you know what? They come to you, and there's no incentive to pull off. In the old days, I remember the old days when Bohm's was right next to the high, you know, but now it's all so built up, and, and so now you can't see any of that stuff, so it's not really obvious. As a matter of fact, new residents don't even, you know, our neighbor is Tavares Jackson, the backup quarterback for the Seahawks. You can't, I, by the way, I have so much fun going there where I say, I'm from the world champion city of Seattle. And they boo me in Wisconsin. And Denver. But yeah, yeah too bad. And you know what I tell them? I did, my, I did my internship for the Seahawks their very first year. I was 23 years old. That's how long it took us to win a championship. Anyway. But Tavar Jackson, I was out talking to him, and he says, you know, Roger, I don't know this area at all. And he, he says, I know there's that, ta that town at Issaquah, I think that's how you pronounce it. You know, he doesn't know how to say Puyallup yet. And um, he says, but I, he goes, how do I get up there? I said, well, just, we're right off of SR 900. Um, and I said, just go down to SR, follow this all the way down in there. He says, but when I get there, I get dumped on Interstate 90. He didn't even know where you turn on Gilman Boulevard that that might, he said, is there a downtown in Issaquah? There is no sign. See, so there's all these new residents that don't know about Bohm's Chocolates or any of these places. They don't know about Gilman Village. And they don't know how to find it even if you told them. 
And so that's the challenge. And by the way, less than 5% of visitors ever stop a visitor information if they find that. If you have one in Iswa, I have no idea where it is. Okay. So there you go. It plays a role in your branding efforts. It's part of your marketing. It reinforces a positive experience. It increases spending. I mean, all of these things are why you do wayfinding. And by the way, this is not a public works project. It is as much a science as it is an art. One of the best things you could do. And work with your auxiliary organizations. If we want to come here and meet with Kiwanis Center, this is Gig Harbor. They put these in a place where people can stop and find out when Rotary meets and where. Because visitors are always welcome. Bothell is just doing one now. By the way, they just started putting it up. So if you go up to Bothell in a couple of months, you're going to start to see more of a wayfinding system. It all fits into their marketing. And so they put together all this, and they're calling their downtown Bothell Landing, and they're working on it. And by the way, you have such a great downtown. And so anyway, this is all part of it. It's all part of the marketing. And by the way, oh, I didn't mean to do that. By the way, if you go here, that curve that you saw in their brochures and everything is because of this little iconic bridge they have over the Sammamish Slough. And so they did that kind of that curve on everything that they did. And so then it, they did all of this is the look and feel of what they're doing and then how it fits into the signs. And so they put together a whole wayfinding system and there's the entrance. By the way, this is already built and uh, just went up a couple months ago. They actually did a little different one than those. But they have the Sammamish Slough there. They wanted to make it really environmental, so they did this wrought iron scroll work there. But this is all part of a wayfinding system. And this isn't the whole thing, but I just wanted to quickly give you what all is included in wayfinding. So it's vehicular, it's pedestrian, it is uh, pole banners, decorative pole banners like you see right there. It includes visitor information kiosks, all of these different things. And it's a state highway going through Bothell. Yes, ma'am. Um, the city of Bothell paid for it, and they got some federal grants. There's federal grant money out there, but the city paid for most of it. And then the rest was offset by federal grants. So, um, so it's usually it's something that the city does. So you see, this is more pedestrian-oriented. This here is obviously vehicles. This is their gateway into their downtown. And, and so that's what it's all going to look like. This is They're just putting these up right now. And so they're just now starting it, but everybody's getting into this wayfinding game, and so I think it's really important. By the way, when we talked, we talked about finding a unique proposition. There's, you know, in Puget Sound, we have the haves and have-nots. The have-nots. Burien, White Center, Bothell, Kent, Auburn. You know what I'm talking about? People see them as have-nots, and, and it's not true, that, and they're not, but that's the way they're perceived. The haves do it, Issaquah, Bellevue. Edmonds, um, probably Muckle Teal now. You know, in the old days, Walla Walla was a have-not. It was about prisons. Then it was about onions. Now look at Walla Walla. It's wine country. Huge turnaround. But you're right. So Bothell is doing this. This is all part of their whole image makeover that they're working on. In Barrie, Ontario, this is their general signs, but when you come into downtown, it kind of changes. So it's the general shape, but then when you come into downtown, it can shift. For you, it might be more historic. It might be, you know, because I still love the old dairy gold plant there. And so the, those kinds of things. And number seven, your downtown should be your showcase. And here's what I say about that. Tourism in downtown should be joined at the hip. And here's what I say about that. The heart and soul of every community besides its people is its downtown. Any site selector that's going to come here is going to go into your downtown. The health of your downtown is the health of the community. And if you don't hang out in downtown Issaquah, guess what? Neither are we. If you're going to Bellevue, that's where we're going to go. That's the way it is with visitors. And even locals that live around you. And the number one activity of visitors in the world is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly setting. And that is where 80% of non-lodging visitor spending takes place. So, that's what you need to know about downtown why do you think Disney put downtown Disney outside each of its parks? To get that 80%. And so, like I said, downtowns and tourism should be joined at the hip. 
And critical mass is what you need in downtown Issaquah. And I'm just on Front Street. And I'm going to talk about three blocks of Front Street. And you need to have like businesses grouped together. If you want downtown Issaquah to be as big of an attraction as Port Townsend, LaConnor, Paulsbow, all our favorite little towns, which you could do, here's what you need to have. We call it the 10-10-10 rule. In just three lineal blocks, this is what you need to have. So I'm not talking about all of downtown, and I'm not talking about, so the critical mass could apply to Gilman Village. It could also apply to Front Street, but not together. Three lineal blocks. This is what you need to have. 10 places that sell food. So if you had 10 of those in Gilman Village and 10 of those in Front Street, you'd have two major destinations. But you need to have at least 10 of those in one of these places, minimum. And then 10 destination retail shops that are non-chain and non-franchise. Okay? And I don't know how you're doing, but this is retail and restaurants. If you want downtown to be a destination, this is minimum. And three lino blocks, not four, not five, not square block. And 10 places open after 6 o'clock. How are you doing on that, Issaquah? Your downtown should have the mall mentality. Gilman Village needs to have the mall mentality, and they do somewhat, and so does Front Street should have. And by the way, they're perfectly complementary. What's that? Yeah, so well, yeah, I, could go, I could do a whole thing on parking, but you're absolutely right, yeah. And so here's what you have to have. Consistent hours and days for everyone. So you can't say, well, in Gilman Village, you can be open whenever you want, close whenever you want. You know what? If you sign a lease in South Center, Northgate, Bellevue Square, any mall, you know what's going to say in there? In your lease, you're going to say you're going to open at 10 o'clock. If you're not open by 10.05, you're fined $1,000 for every five minutes you open late. That's in a mall lease. They all open at the same time. So part of the problem with Gilman Village, I never know when anything's open because now it's a hodgepodge of hours and days. And that's really sad. So there's no continuity. They need to be open in the evening hours, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. By the way, I started, when I was going to college, I was going to the University of Washington. Sorry, Wazoo folk. No, it's, and you know what? I worked at Sears and Bellevue. You know where I'm talking about, Overlake. When I was working there, this is how old I am, it was only open at 12 to 5 on Sundays, oh, closed at 6. That's the way retail used to be, but we're moving to the European standard. We're shopping later at night, we're eating later at night, and guess what? You will not go to a mall that is not open until 9 o'clock at night, seven days a week. Downtowns don't get it, and that's why downtowns are dying. And so, like businesses grouped together, you will never go into Bellevue Square and find an H&R block in there, an, an engineer's office. See what I mean? They have like businesses grouped together. You won't find a pregnancy clinic in there. You won't find City Hall inside of Bellevue Square or any successful mall, Alderwood, you name it. And they all have anchor tenants. And they're a central gathering place. I think about this antique mall. They do 10 times the business when they're grouped together. I mean, why is it that we used to have, why do we have auto malls? Because they're all, why does Chevy want to be right next to Toyota, Subaru, and Honda? Because they do seven times the business when they're grouped together. Same thing why we have corner gas stations, lifestyle retail centers now. They're replacing downtowns. That's what Renton Landing is, or Kent Station, all those places. And downtown Renton's pretty much dead because they're all going to Renton Landing. And they're mimicking the downtown experience with plenty of parking, a mix of restaurants. They all have the critical mass there. And it's unfortunate because they're all chain. It's not unique. And that's, that's the disappointing side of that. And then, of course, food courts. It works. I'll give you one example. We're working in Halifax, and they have this waterfront, beautiful waterfront. You go up a really steep hill to Argyle Street. And on Argyle Street, and by the way, it's a bigger city, but on Argyle Street, there was lots of agencies, a hodgepodge mix of businesses. It was just whoever wanted to rent could rent. They didn't orchestrate the business mix. And that's something that I think is starting to happen in Gilman Village, at least one of the times I was there. But you know what happened is, by the way, what happened there? Their challenge was, why would anybody go up the hill? And so for some reason, that didn't show up on my slide here. So 
there was a restaurant down here called Opa, and he thought, I want to make this into a restaurant row. And so you know what he did? He started going to all the vacant buildings and everything, going in there and said, you know what? If I brought in a restaurant, would you give him a good deal for the first couple of years so I could get enough restaurants? This is a restaurant bringing in competitors. And then he went to the city and said, city, the sidewalks aren't that wide. Would it be okay if we put down, we, we took up all the sidewalks for dining and we'd have pedestrians walk around? And the city said, you know what? If you want to lose the parking, no problem for me. You know, no problem for us in the city. You can lease the sidewalks for a buck a year and just make sure that people can get around. So he started recruiting restaurants in here. It's pretty homemade because they have severe winters. They have to pick it all up for snow removal. They store it all in the winter. And he started recruiting in more and more restaurants. And each restaurant did their own thing, all with the outdoor dining. And you can see it right here, pretty homemade. But you know what? It works. And they just recruited more and more and more. And the place is just packed. And he owned Opa Restaurant right there. In fact, it's been so successful. Well, I'll tell you in a minute. They put in all these little planners and everything. And it's amazing. They do it for six months of the year. And it has worked so well that it's starting to go in other areas of downtown Halifax. And even down that steep side street, they did those little terrace decks. Pretty cool. And guess what? They have 22 restaurants at two and a half blocks. It is now the major gathering spot, and it rivals the waterfront. Remember, it was 60% vacant. And it is the place to go hang out. And all the rest, you know, I went to that guy. I said, you did this. You now have 21 competitors. How's that working for you? Because it was just him and the subway were the only two restaurants there. He goes, Roger, I own four of them. And another guy owns three. He says, my Opa restaurant that I started with is doing 10 times the business. You know, if you had 20 restaurants in downtown Esquire, you'd have people coming from all over the Northwest to your downtown. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, but whatever it is, galleries, whatever your focus is, if you had a bunch of those, you'd have people coming from everywhere. And now they're building a major convention center in Halifax. They were going to build it on the waterfront. They're now building it on Argyle Street. In three blocks, three lineal blocks? Fantastic. Are you sure? In three lineal blocks, not square blocks. I had no idea. See, this is why you need to do a best of. I've eaten at the, tw I've eaten, I've eaten at the, the little one right next to the Village Theater. I eat there all the time. Fins. I've eaten at Fins. I've eaten at the Mexican place. I ate at, what is it, Frog? What is the Ale Company? Is it still there? It's on a side street. Yeah, the brewery, the brew house. But I didn't know it. See, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. You should hang your hat on that. Matter of fact, your focus could be culinary. It's one of the fastest growing segments in tourism. So sometimes you have to orchestrate the efforts. I had no idea about that. And I, I've been downtown lots. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Wolf runs it. Er Eric. Yeah. Culinary attracts the highest in visitors. And by the way, we're not talking about all of them spending the night, but you know what? If you can get people to come here from Bellevue rather than us going there and eating in the usual chains, that would be awesome. But see, that's something that we just don't know because we don't know anything about Issaquah. You don't stand for anything other than being a nice bedroom community. There you go. There's the big one. Seventy percent of all consumer bricks and mortar, I'm talking about retail, takes place after 6 p.m. And you're still in that 6 o'clock mentality. Right there. I mean, I want you to... Right there. You know what, down, you know what the future of downtowns are? It's where we go after work and on weekends. And you're closed. So, I just want to let you know I'll give you a good example. Even farmer's markets are moving into the evening hours, by the way. Markets, evening hours. I'll give you one example. Sparks, Nevada is right next to Reno. They call it East Reno. They had a farmer's market. It was open every Thursday from 10 to 2. Average attendance was 500. 
They went there during lunch. Then they moved it from 11 till 7, and it doubled to 1,000 because they had lunch and dinner. And then they moved it from 11 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. They lined it with all of these booths here. They added entertainment to their farmer's market, and the average attendance is 10,000. Even public markets are moving to the evening hours. We're looking for things to do after 5 o'clock. When we get off that Microsoft bus or whatever we're doing at work, when we come home, we want things to do after 5 o'clock. We want things to do. Let's go downtown Issaquah tonight. But you know what? Two businesses being open is not enough. Or only the Village Theater. Because you know what? Shopping and dining go together. Dining and entertainment go together. Yes, sir. Yeah, your art walks are great. You're right. But it has to be consistent. See what I mean? And that's, yeah. And here's another statistic. Women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I, I see that. Woohoo! I'm, I'm waiting. Usually there's a guy that'll say, that's all. But women rule the world. We know that. I'm not, guys, am I telling you anything new? No, okay. So I want to make sure you knew that. They also make 70% of the travel decisions of where we're going to stay, where we're going to go, where we're going to eat. 70% of the time. And by the way, the 50 plus women are the healthiest, wealthiest, and most active in history. 80% use the internet when buying. 70% new business. And look at this. 92% pass on information to other women. Facebook, Twitter, you name it. 92%. You know, how, you know what the percentage is for men? Less than 25%. Men don't tell other, other friends anything, but women, 92% of the time. So in your marketing, guess who you're going to cater to? And then moms represent a $2.4 trillion market. And they control, the women now control 60% of all personal wealth, and there are more women now online than men. Pretty cool. By the way, I want you to look at this next picture and tell me what you see. This was not staged. What do you see? Yeah, you're getting it. Yeah, you're so, you get that. That was not staged. Guess what the guys are doing and guess where the women are. I have two words for you downtown Issaquah. Think benches. Lots of them. That's what you need to do. The guys will always be sitting out front, and that's what you need to do. Here's the third one. 70% of first-time sales come from curb appeal. We all travel. Have you ever said these very words? That looks like a nice place to eat. 70% of first-time sales. Once we've been in there, like that barbecue place I showed you, then we'll eat there again. But the first time I went there, I went, whoa, I don't think I want to go in there. And so that's what you need to know. Look at curb appeal. Curb appeal, there's nothing more powerful than curb appeal. This is a little town of Mahone Bay in Nova Scotia. Population is about 3,500. This is a little pizza restaurant. In Fredericksburg, Texas, all the merchants got together and they went and they just got, some put in 25, they, they did a donation thing. Some people put in 25 bucks, some people put in 200 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever they could afford. They went over to big nursery like Mobax is here, or even you could go to a Home Depot or anywhere, and they said, at the end of the year, in October or November, we want to buy all your pots. The only thing is they have to be 21-inch opening or bigger, because we didn't want little pots. And they have to be 21-inch or bigger, and we, they don't even all have to match. They just went and bought wholesale any extra inventory that they could afford. They brought them all out into Fredericksburg. They put them on a side street. Then on an, and then they had the merchants just come and grab a bunch of them. They didn't say, you only put in $25, so you only get one. They didn't do that. It was just all a free-for-all. So this person grabbed all of these. You can see a person down there grabbed a little different one. This lady grabbed these two. Uh, another merchant, there was a bunch left over, so he did a whole grouping of them. You know, you can see them there. Then on the next side street, they put a pile of dirt there, 15, a dump truck to load 15 yards. Then they brought in the high school students, band, 
cheerleaders, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, anybody looking to raise money, kids. And they had them put all the, the, the dirt in the pots. And then they went and bought a whole bunch, and they made sure that 50% of the things in the pots were evergreen. And the other 50% were perennials or annuals. So go out here and do a deal with Squawk Mountain. It's my favorite nursery in western Washington next to the Mulbach. That's a love that place. And go and say, well, do you have a lot of inventory that you could get rid of at the end of the year that you could help us out? So they did this in downtown Fredericksburg. This is what it looks like. And their retail sales just skyrocketed. And by the way, you know why they hired the kids to do that? They had no vandalism. Because pr kids protect things they take ownership of. Retail sales just skyrocketed. They didn't know the exact amount. Before, town of Nina, Wisconsin. That's before. Notice the facade. After, retail sales went up by a third just by doing that. Before, after. A third. So all of that is the 787 rule. There you go. And those are the three things that you need to really think of in your downtown. And even with visitor information, you don't have that, but we're here to work on tourism for you. It may be things you need to do, but with visitor information, it's going to have to be pretty, consent, pretty consistent. Now, it doesn't have to be to this level. We don't know yet. We just don't know yet. But I would just want to let you know it's one of the things we're going to look at. But in Little Beatty, Nevada, they had, actually had Rotary gave them a, a Rotary bought a gazebo for them, and Kiwanis put it together, and then inside they just put this, and it's got brochures wrapped all the way around it. Somewhere in Issaquah, you could use two or three visitor information, even if it's just like this. That's in Jackson, Wyoming. And so, just little places like this. This is Kingsport, Tennessee, which is cool. They built a brick thing right here, and there's brochures right here, and each person pays $5 a month to be in there. That keeps it stocked, keeps it clean, well, supposedly keeps it clean. And, and then they, and they're, any money left over, they're building another one. So having two or three of those in Issaquah would be great. And then develop and encourage additional outdoor dining. You know, wherever you can. I know you have a couple of them. And I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. And by the way, so these are all outdoor dining. This is all part of the future being the European standard, where they built every town around piazzas and stuff. That's in Fredericksburg right there. That's in Covington, Kentucky. All of these. As much as you can do this, it'll bring downtown to life during the season. And by the way, even in Asheville, North Carolina, they call it the crack rule. It has nothing to do with low-hanging jeans or drugs. The rule is that the chairs need to be on this side of this crack in the sidewalk. Now, if somebody goes over and they don't sit there and say, oh, oh, oh you're going to get a ticket or anything, they just said, could you move your chair in? Matter of fact, they don't regulate it to death. And in Asheville, if you build a restaurant there, they will actually, and you have a five-year lease, they will actually build a curb out for you and lose parking to extend restaurants. And so, you know, and by the way, you think, well, how does this fit with ADA, American with Disabilities Act? And you know what? They have never once had a lawsuit because, you know, the second they see somebody in a wheelchair, the patron will say, oh, excuse me, and they'll scoot their chair, and they've never had a problem. Sometimes we regulate our downtowns to death. And so this is all in downtown Asheville, and it's a great destination. Here, a restaurant did a five-year lease, so the city said, we're going to lose two parking spaces, we're going to build this curb out here and to allow them to do outdoor dining. So there it is again, and there it is from the street, from up above. You know, and it doesn't even have to be, this is in Salem, Massachusetts. These are silk. So it doesn't even have to be expensive. But here's an idea for Issaquah. Now, you know what the future of Issaquah is? To have no parking on front streets. I know, this is going to be really controversial. But you know, the future is we're moving to the European stand. We want out of our cars. You know, you have to go over here across the, you have to do this side. You know what I'm talking about up on the hill where you've got all that mixed use and everything, the new urbanism? People want out of their cars. They want the pedestrian experience. And so, you know what I tell merchants to say? If you take the parking out in front of my store, you're going to kill my business. You know what I tell them? Are you telling me your business isn't worth walking two blocks for? Or one block? But I'm not suggesting you do that.
But you know, in Nelson, British Columbia, that's what, exactly what they do. During the summer months, they allow a restaurant to actually take up two parking spots. This I took in October. They're taking it all down for the winter. And so he took off this fascia here and everything. But they allow restaurants to put a deck out there and take two parking spaces just so that you keep your sidewalks wide open or you can route your pedestrians around. So there it is. That's that one in front of the Redfish Grill. This is in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. So they allow restaurants to do that. And in their case, the restaurants take up the sidewalk and the people walk around these. So here's another one. Here's, this is in Wolfville. As you can see where the pedestrians walk around. You know what it does? It slows traffic. It makes downtown more desirable and it gets people to hang out. And so doing all kinds of things like this can really bring your downtown to life. This is Canmore, Alberta, population 10,000. They've got these little cafes everywhere. And it's just really, really a cool place. It's a great destination. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. And the whole idea, and the whole idea is to bring downtown to life. That's what you want to do. You know, the, you know why I eat at your Mexican restaurant? Because they had outdoor cafes. You know, the couple times I've eaten there. So I want to show you just one more. I know these chairs are probably getting really painful about now, aren't they? And so this is one. By the way, this is it right here. This is in the town of Barrie, Ontario. And uh, this is so you can see where ADA goes out there. And they did this. And um, what happened is their downtown, they had 14 restaurants do that. And their downtown just took off. It just skyrocketed. Those are the kinds of things you can do. But anyway, the whole idea is invest your money in product development, and then you'll become a great destination. So I just want to show you a couple of case histories, and then we'll be done. Asheville, North Carolina, bigger town. How much the population is for, anyway? Like 30,000? 35,000? That's what I thought. And so, claim to fame, they're along the Blue Ridge Parkway. The challenge is the parkway is 500 miles long. Has anybody here ever been to Asheville, North Carolina? Pretty cool place, huh? And 10 years ago, it was dead. This was their, their slogan, where altitude affects attitude. I went, it makes it sound like it's hard to breathe there. And so, this was their old logo. Does it make you want to go there? This is the new one. They have not convinced their police department to put that on the sides of their cars yet. Although I thought the slogan, any way you like it, buddy, would be a good thing for a cop. But here was their challenge. How do you promote a town that's known for the Biltmore Estate? It's the largest home in North America. It's 145,000 square feet. It is the finest in fine culture. So how do you brand and market a town that's known for Biltmore Estate there and their downtown, though, is known for counterculture. So how do you make this work when you got where fine culture meets counterculture? Take a look at this. Excuse me. I've got a question about the chandelier. Visit exploreashville.com. Pretty clever, huh? See, it's a feeling that makes you want to go there. So how do you make your outdoor recreation different than everybody else's outdoor recreation? Look what they did. Hey, honey. Visit exploreashville.com. Ready to go? I thought she just said unclothed. And this is quintessential Asheville, North Carolina. Take a look. you want to go there how cool is that it's a feeling all their ads look like that and you know what livability.com named us one of the top five places in the united states to live and by the way their culinary scene is incredible they even do 
culinary travel without consequence, you could do lift a whisk, not weights, and burn 510 calories. So they did itineraries there, calorie burn itineraries. How cool is that? This is what you need to do in Issaqua. Find your niche. You know? And by the way, their tourism organization was the leadership organization in doing all of this. And so well, there is that logo. There's their downtown. There's that corner I showed you. It is so alive after 6 o'clock. They even went down their sidewalks and they put these like bus shelters. These are all vendors. So every morning at 10, they bring out these boxes and set them there. It's kind of an open public market right in their downtown. I mean, they even took an old Woolworth building and it's all full of artisans, not an antique mall. And by the way, they all have to live within a 30 mile radius. You know, and they have street performers out there always. You should do that too. You could, even if you have to pay them at first to do it, they don't have to pay them. They're out there 360 days a year. They'll have entertainers out there. No charge. Even restaurants are getting into the act. This is a restaurant here. I'll give you this little case history. This restaurant and this restaurant are two different restaurants. They each paid this band $100. So they paid the band $200. I took this picture at 430. I said, when do you serve? I went into the manager of this restaurant. I said, when do you serve? Danny said, we don't start serving until 5. I said, well, how can we have the band out there now at 4.30? He says, oh, they actually start at 4. I said, why? He says, well, you know, Roger, by 4.30, I have happy hour. I've already paid for the band. And by the way, when I serve dinner at 5, I'm already full. And it's all because of the entertainment out there. And none of it is amplified. And you know what? I worked in a city where they did those decks out there, and that's where they put the entertainment, and then they had the dining on the sidewalk. So where you have narrow sidewalks, you can utilize some of that parking for decks, and there's ways to make that work for downtown. And they do that, and it works. It's incredible. And by the way, the average age in Asheville over 10 years dropped by 20 years. The average age of a person living there. The average age in Asheville is now 32. It used to be like way up because people went there and retired there. And it's just incredible destination. You can even play chess right downtown. Even my wife Jane got caught up in the act when we were in Asheville. And their public market is called the Grove Market. It is so cool. And that's what they do. And by the way, notice those colors in that logo? It is now in all of their wayfinding signage. It's everywhere you go. And they're all about art. So they made sure every sign had a little finial that was done by a local artisan, whether it's that, whether it's that. They, every one of them did something different. And there's those colors on the signs right there. See what I mean how it all integrates? And that's what you need to do. So Issaquah, you need to start with, what do we want to be when we grow up? Do you want to be a culinary destination? Or do you want to just be a bedroom community? Do you want to get into the tourism game? And if so, do you want people spending the night or do you just want those day trippers coming here instead of Snoqualmie Falls? And so that's what you have to understand. And, and by the way, they now do Segway tours in downtown Asheville. How cool is that? I'd love to see that in Issaquah. That would be fun. And so it's become one of the nation's best destinations. I'll give you just one more and then I'm done. Because I know that I looked at those chairs and I went, oh boy. They're really cool, but probably for a couple hours, pretty tough. This is a town of 20,000. It's in southern, south central Arkansas, about 45 minutes away from Shreveport, Louisiana. That was their challenges. And they just became this showtime place where their whole downtown, it's about showtime. It's based on two theaters like you have. But they made the whole downtown about showtime. And so everything that they do looks like that. Wouldn't that be cool? Talk about playing up the Village Theater and your two theaters, playing up, you know, so they did that for their activities guide. Everything is about showtime. Someplace needs to do that here. You know, there it is. What are you doing this weekend? Where are you headed this weekend? And they did a whole series of these. So you need to find that. And even for conventions and stuff, it all looks like that. It takes on a whole new meeting. Even their pole banners in their downtown are going to look like that. They haven't put them up yet. And their website and everything is going to look like this. So they're just working on it. And the last one. This is a bedroom community to Houston. Matter of fact, look at that. You know why? They're right next to NASA. But what happens when NASA is cutting back? 
and they had everybody commuted out. Sound familiar? At, at 7 o'clock in the morning, you hear rush hour out of town, and then at 5 o'clock, 5.30, rush hour back into town. And they were really struggling. It was a great place to live, great schools, but that's it. There was no real connection. So we did a whole lifestyle brand for them. We call it Lee City Style. And it's kind of by Galveston and Houston, that area. And they wanted to attract all these kinds of businesses there. This is their economic development list. And so that's what we made it look like. Typical day at the office, League City style. Or corporate attire, League City style. White shirt, tie, shorts and flip-flops. And they're attracting younger. Here's lunch break, League City style. You can see who they're catering to the youngers, the, t the creative professionals. And there it is, conference attire, League City style. You know, there's the Kima Boardwalk, and they even said there's team building, League City style. And so that's what you could do. It could be a lifestyle brand for you, or it could be an asset base, whatever it is. What do you want to be, League City, or Issaquah, when you grow up? What do you want to be known for? What's going to put you on the map? You're a great city, but you don't really have any focus out there. So... Finally, all this stuff is now coming to League City. It's everything that they wanted. It's all coming there now. And it's been great. And so my last thing, whatever it is you put out there, you have to deliver on the promise. So are those 26 restaurants open seven days a week or six days a week? Do they have consistent hours? Do you have the retail to go along with them? See what I mean? And what is your focus in everything? It's a promise, whatever you put out there. And you must deliver on that promise. And that promise is an expectation. So if you say you're something and it's gone, we come there, it better be what we expected. And I want to show you a little one-minute commercial just to put it into perspective in human terms. Take a look at this. I know it's going to start. <laughs> And so, you know, you, you have such a great community. You have such a great downtown. And Gilman Village is awesome. I mean, you have so much going for you. But you know what? What's your focus? And that's what you need to figure out so that you can get past being more than just a bedroom, a nice bedroom community. And, um, and so, you know, that's it. So you got any questions? I could answer questions for a few minutes, and if you want to stand up, feel free, stretch your eye, your, your back and everything, that'd be great. There you go. Does that feel better?